Friends, our second New Testament reading today comes from the 12th chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 19. Listen for the word of God to you. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly! And the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. And he did so. Then he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened for them of its own accord. They went outside and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a maiden named Rhoda came to answer, and on recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind, but she insisted that it was so. They said it was his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. And he left and went to another place. When morning came, there was no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and could not find him, he examined the guards and ordered them to be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together again. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light. In your truth, find freedom, and in your will, discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to that end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the record, I hate roller coasters. At least the really big ones. I can handle the Disney stuff, the kid coasters. I can even venture onto an adult-sized coaster every once in a while. I can even enjoy it every once in a while. But more than once, and I am a hot mess of nausea and shakiness and dizziness, and the ones that advertise their 90-degree drop or some other kind of horrific and unspeakable madness, forget about it. I am out. I have no interest in feeling as if all of my organs have left my body. I have no interest in feeling like I'm on the verge of sudden death. I, I just don't, that doesn't appeal to me. No thank you. 
A friend of mine, a good friend, on the other hand, loves them. Cannot get enough of them, will ride the biggest and the craziest, and has even made it her own spiritual discipline to relax her entire body as much as possible when she reaches the peak of the roller coaster's insanity, and she tries to maintain the same level of relaxation throughout the entire ride. I find it to be absolutely insane, and not to mention completely impossible. And so on the one, yes, only one occasion when we found ourselves on a roller coaster sitting next to each other, when that harness locked into place and we began our first climb to our impending death, I was a hot mess of regret and panic. And she was absolutely beaming. She turned to me with a smile that reached from ear to ear and said, fasten your seatbelt, Rachel, we're in for a wild ride. And I somehow managed to get through without losing my lunch. We find the early church on a bit of a roller coaster ride itself in the 12th chapter of Acts. Since that mighty day of Pentecost, the church has known ups and downs, twists and turns, many of which no one ever saw coming. Some of the twists and turns have been so dramatic and so unexpected that I imagine at least a handful of folks in the early church thought the ride was going to kill them before they ever had a chance to get off. After all, after all how could this new reality, this church without borders or boundaries, how could this possibly be what God had in mind for the church? It's so different, so incomprehensible, so dangerous. How could this be what God had in mind? Remember that among these ups and downs, these twists and turns, the church has experienced incredible growth. It's been thriving, both in Jerusalem and in the wider world. Folks are lining up to be baptized. And just prior to our text today, if you recall last week, the love of God turned in a striking and startling direction to include even the Gentiles. A radical, unexpected move in the life of the early church, but one that demonstrated just how determined the Spirit of God was to blow apart the old way and make room for something new. All are welcome. All are included in the embrace of God's love. It is a wild ride indeed. But the church is now facing the frightening realities of suffering and persecution. Leaders and church members alike are being beaten, imprisoned, and executed. Any hope for a safe and easy existence for the church and for those who have dedicated themselves to it, well, that's, that's far gone. It's a terrifying time, and fear strikes at the hearts of many. The road behind them and before them is not for the faint of heart, and if the Spirit of God is communicating anything during this time, it is certainly not sit back and enjoy the ride so much as it is fasten your seatbelts, because we are in for a wild one. A wild one indeed as we jump headfirst into the text in the 12th chapter of Acts. Peter is in prison. King Herod, not the King Herod from the time of Jesus' birth, but the grandson of that Herod, also named Herod, King Herod has just executed James, one of the original disciples. And though the details remain sketchy about the reason for Peter's imprisonment, it is clear that Herod sees this new church as a threat, and its leaders as the biggest threat of all. So Peter is taken into custody to await his execution. And on the eve of his scheduled execution, as the church prays fervently for him, Peter experiences an amazing series of events. It seems like he is dreaming. An angel appears and communicates some version of, fashion your seatbelt, Peter, let's get out of here fast. These chains fall off his arms. He appears invisible to multiple guards that he walks right by. A heavy gate opens all on its own. 
And once Peter finds himself alone and free, he sort of shakes himself to his senses and knows that he has had absolutely nothing to do with the events that have taken place. Rather, he proclaims God has done this, echoing many faithful servants who have come before him. It's a similar proclamation made after the people of Israel escaped the Egyptians through the Red Sea. It's essentially the same proclamation that Mary made when she learned of her pregnancy. God has done this. There is no other explanation. God has made the impossible possible. Taking a sharp turn on the track that no one ever saw coming. And we are but servants along for the ride. God has done this. And though Peter has been freed from incarceration, he has not yet been delivered to safety. I imagine he traveled quickly and quietly in the dead of night, still uncertain what this newfound freedom would mean or where it would take him. But he set his sights toward Mary's house, Mary the mother of John Mark, a place where he knew the church would be gathered. And sure enough, there they were praying fervently for Peter's release, perhaps staying up all night to pray and plead with God that Peter might be spared. And then if you were paying attention, the next few scenes almost seem like they could be something out of a comedy series. Here Peter stands knocking on the outer gate to the house while everyone is inside praying for this exact thing to happen, for his release. A servant Rhoda, she comes to the door, she recognizes his voice, she is so astounded and overjoyed that she forgets to open the door for Peter. Peter. She runs inside to tell everyone that, hey, guys, Peter's outside. And they think she's crazy. Rhoda, we're praying. Can you come back another? We're praying for Peter. Don't you know why we're up here in this room? Please, leave us alone. Rhoda, this is really inappropriate. You must be crazy or dreaming, please. And Peter, Peter is knocking on the door right outside this entire time. And finally, these prayer warriors inside must actually hear some vague knocking themselves, so they head out to investigate. And there's Peter, the one they have been praying for. They are startled. He is alive. He is well. They are amazed, reminded once again that God ought not to be underestimated in God's ability to make the impossible possible. And so the church better fasten their seatbelts because there is no telling what twists or turns God will make possible next. But here's what's striking to me about this story in Acts 12. God is providing this ride but God is leaving it up to the church to decide if they want to hop aboard. Think about it. God has made angels appear to Peter. God is hitting Peter over the head with a two-by-four. God has made chains fall off his arms, and God has basically provided an invisibility cloak for him to escape past the guards. But Peter didn't have to trust that this was God. Peter didn't have to hop aboard this crazy ride that for all intents and purposes could be leading him even more quickly to his untimely death. Peter had to figure out what God was doing. And then God was trusting that Peter would take the next step on his own. Similarly, we have this church praying fervently for Peter's release. He's standing, knocking at the door, outside. God has somehow managed to free Peter from prison in a story that can only be described as miraculous. And then Peter finds himself locked out of the very house where they're praying, waiting for the church to come to its senses. God may be taking care of the ride, but the church, the church has to be willing to hop on, to meet God in the midst of it, God doesn't take care of every door. The church has to open a few on its own. I imagine if you thought about it, 
You might have a story like that in your own life, where you felt nudged or prodded by the Spirit of God, perhaps feeling hit over the head by a two-by-four, but it was up to you what steps you took next. When I was interviewing for jobs almost two years ago, now I found myself in conversation with five different churches, one of them being this church. Before too much time had gone by, five became three, three became two, and I was in the midst of final interviews with two very different churches. Though I was feeling deeply called to Morrisville, though I was struck how weighty and abundant that call felt, I was not yet ready to close the door on the other church. I traveled south to meet with their search committee. I spent three hours engaged in meaningful and exciting conversation about the future they imagined and all the ways that they felt God at work in their midst. And then the entire drive home, over and over and over again, I saw signs on the highway that said, Morrisville. Morrisville, this way to Morrisville, this way to Morrisville. Combine the literal signs overhead with the call that I felt deep in my heart, and it also felt as if God was hitting me upside the head with a two-by-four. God was providing the ride, but you and I both had to hop on board. And boy, am I glad... I did. In the past year and a half, I have felt so at home here, so welcomed here. I have felt the Spirit of God alive and at work here in so many ways. In our worship, in our music, in conversations with so many of you, and in the countless ways I have witnessed God's love being spread throughout these halls, this sanctuary, and out into the world to serve God's people. God is alive. Make no mistake about it, friends. God is alive and at work in this place. But I have also felt a strong sense that our work together is just beginning. That God has much in store for us in the years to come and is even now at work on a new and terrifying and exciting ride that you and I have yet to imagine or fathom. A ride that I imagine will take us places we've never been before. A ride that may move us out into the world and out into relationships in this world that we never saw coming or perhaps never wanted at all. A ride that may descend deeply into the soul of who we know ourselves to be and transform us into something altogether different, but something altogether faithful. But this story in Acts 12 has me wondering. When God comes knocking with that ride, when God creates a tight turn in the track that we never saw coming, when God offers us a reality we never imagined could be possible and perhaps never dreamed we'd ever want, will we have the courage and the wisdom to leave our prayer meeting long enough to answer the door? Will we have the openness to let go of our own agenda long enough to see the wonders that God is doing? Will we be like Herod, threatened by these new ways, threatened by this new ride, and thus making every effort to squash it? Will we trust faithful saints like Rhoda, or will we ignore them? Faithful saints who may be the only ones with eyes to see the miracles that God is doing in our midst. Will we be like Peter, 
recognizing God's action when it's staring us in the face and have the courage to follow even if that means following into the danger and the darkness of the night. Who will we be? What will we be? Because the truth of Acts 12 is that God is always moving. The truth of the entire book of Acts is that God is always moving. Always creating something new, always making the impossible possible. And sometimes, if we have eyes to see it, God is doing that right in front of us. But will we have eyes and ears and hearts open to receive it? God's wondering too. I have a special place in my heart for the 1989 classic Parenthood, starring Steve Martin and Mary Steenburgen. And one of my very favorite scenes is near the end of this movie, when Grandma overhears the parents arguing about jobs and stress and kids and the potential burden of having another one. Well, Grandma walks into the room and, without skipping a beat, interrupts the conversation and tells them this story. When I was 19, Grandpa took me on a roller coaster. Up, down, up, down, oh, what a ride. I always wanted to go again. You know, it was just so interesting to me that a ride, a ride could make me so so frightened, so scared, so safe, so excited, and so thrilled all together. Some didn't like it. They went on the merry-go-round. And that just goes around. Nothing. I like the roller coaster. There's no one I'd rather be on the roller coaster with than all of you. I have no doubt that aboard this ride together, there will be ups and downs and twists and turns. Some may feel familiar and safe, and some may feel so unexpected that we never saw them coming. Some will feel so different and terrifying, we might be tempted to get off the ride before it's even over. And some, some might be so exhilarating and exciting that we'll wonder how we ever lived without it. And maybe, just maybe, there will be a wild and wondrous moment when we'll be able to relax together and enjoy the wild ride on the wind of God's Spirit. I'm in if you are, so fasten your seatbelts, church, because God is on the move. And when God is on the move, God only knows what wild and wondrous, impossible things are possible. Thanks be to God. Amen.